Thank you. Thanks for the invitation. It's great to be here. Um, so uh, I should say, usually with this talk, I end up talking for basically the whole time about conjectures and then get to the results at the end. Maybe I'll be able to say something about the proof. I think hopefully some of you will be interested in hearing about the proof, uh, but I'll be around for, for a few days. So if I don't get to it in this talk, I'd be happy to tell you more afterwards. Um, so the, the, the idea is going to be to study some models of population, which are a bit different than the ones you're probably most familiar with, the nearest name models, um, but which are a bit easier or, or perhaps a lot easier. And they, they allow us to attack problems which seem uh, at the moment to be sort of impossibly hard in, in, the, in the classical setting. Um, so I, I want to start by just quickly overviewing uh, what the state of play is for the classical problem. So, uh, so I'm going to be considering Bernoulli bond population on ZD. So that means we start with the hypercubic lattice. We flip a coin for each edge, you know, P heads, one minus P tails, keep the heads, delete the tails. Okay, that's just the definition of the Bernoulli bond population. And of course, we all know that in dimension two and higher, this undergoes a phase transition. If we define PC to be the infimal value of P where infinite clusters exist, this is strictly between zero and one. In dimension two and higher. Okay. And this talk is all going to be about population at the critical point. Okay. So, of course, the most basic qualitative question you can ask is which phase does the critical point belong to, if you like? Do you have infinite clusters at PC or not? Okay. And of course, this is famously solved in two dimensions by Keston back in the 80s and in high dimensions by Har and Slade in the 90s, uh, but remains completely open. In, in especially dimensions three, four, and five and six. Um, this talk is not really about that question, though. It's more about what we would like to do after we've solved that question, when we would like to try to understand this critical phenomena in a more quantitative way. Right? So we expect that in critical population, we only have finite clusters, but we have kind of big clusters. It should be relatively easy for a cluster to be large. And these clusters should have all this kind of interesting fractal geometry and so on. Okay, so I'm going to focus mostly on the question of critical exponents. Of course, there are related interesting questions about scaling limits, which I'll say a little bit about. Um, so I'm going to focus on two exponents, which are for the two point function. So the two point function just means the probability x is connected to y. And all these exponents have these kind of traditional names you get used to. So this one is eta. This is the usual thing. So eta is the exponent governing the two-point function. Um, and you know, if, uh, as as you'll all be familiar with, there's no reason a priori for these things to exist. So you know, proving that the exponents exist is, in many cases, almost as difficult as computing. Um, <laughs> and I'm also going to be looking at the volume tail exponents. And K is my notation for the cluster of the origin. And this is supposed to again decay like a tower. In this case, the traditional notation for this is one over delta. Okay. Of course, there are many other exponents you can look at. I'm just going to focus on these two. OK, so what's known? Well, in high dimensions, so high dimensions is sort of the simplest case for all these questions. So um, and this phenomenon is not specific to population. It happens in, in basically all statistical mechanics models. You know, the, when you have a model that's naturally defined on lattices of every dimension, like population, Easing model, spanning trees, whatever, typically you'll have what's called the upper critical dimension. For percolation, this is six. That's actually kind of unusual. Four is a very common value at the upper critical dimension. You, it can be anything, but percolation is six. And the idea is that once you're above this dimension, the lattice is sort of so spacious that the model doesn't kind of feel the effect of being in the finite dimensional lattice, and it starts to behave the same way as it would in an infinite dimensional setting. 
or, or, or you can alternatively think of it as acting like it would if there's no geometry, okay? So what, what does that mean for percolation? It means it starts to behave like critical branching random walk. You can kind of think about percolation, it's almost like a branching random walk, except when it comes back on itself, uh, the particle dies. And, you know, the idea is that in, in high enough dimensions, that sort of self-interaction is not significant at, at the large scale. Okay, so what does this mean for the exponents? Well, it means these things should be the same as for a branching random walk. So, in particular, the two-point function should be of the same order as the Green's function, which corresponds to this exponent eta being zero. And the probability of the volume being large, well, it should be like a finite variance branching process having total progeny n, which is of order one over return. Okay. And this was proven by Hara and Slade for D very sufficiently large. Okay. No, and this is using a technique called the lace expansion, many of you will, will have heard of. And basically what they need for this to work is either that the dimension is very large or that you're in more than six dimensions and you look at spread out models. So this means instead of taking this standard hypercubic grid, you can imagine you replace this with the graph where you connect any two vertices at distance, 100 or something. And if you take that constant to be big enough, you can make that proof work for any dimension. So uh, it's six, six. Is six the dimension where a randomly embedded critical, you know, Brownian tree doesn't hit itself? No, that's eight. That's eight. Yeah. Okay, so this has- It's a bit subtle why it's six for percolation. So at six, the tree should still be hitting itself. Yeah. Um, yeah, so you can think <laughs> it is related to that, but it's a, it, it's a little bit subtle. I, I can uh, say something. I, I don't know any really good heuristic argument why it's six. I know of various ones that have various different flaws. Uh, the, the, the one that I like the most is that in low dimensions, there are relations between additional relations between the critical exponents called the hyperscaling relations. And six is where the hyperscaling relations are satisfied with the mean field values of the critical exponents. So the, the, that, that's a pretty good reason why it's six. The, the, the reason I don't quite like that is that it's not, it's kind of clear you should have hyperscaling in low enough dimensions and that you should have mean field behavior in high enough dimensions, but why you can't have like two different dimensions where, where those change, um, it's okay. not, I don't know a really good reason for that. So there's no proof, but there's 99% confidence. Uh, I mean, we know that you cannot have all the critical exponents take their mean field values in below six dimensions. The trouble is from... Is the triangle condition useful? Yeah, so yeah, the triangle condition is also relevant, but um, I should say the the proof of this, it, they really prove kind of this aspect, and then this one follows from this triangle condition, which is a sufficient condition for mean field critical behavior uh, due to uh, Michael and, uh, and Neiman. Um, but it's only a sufficient condition. So again, it's not rock solid heuristic argument. Um, but six is, is the correct thing. We, we, we basically know this. Okay. Uh, and I should say that the, uh, you know, they they said they could do it for D at least 19. This has now been pushed down to D at least 11 by uh, Fitzner and van der Hofstadt. But the point is, the, these are kind of perturbative ar arguments. They, they need some quantity associated to the model to be small as an input to start running the argument. So you, you need some quantitative assumption beyond the, the real minimal assumption that you should need. Okay. So that's high dimensions. Now, and I should say that actually uh, for the scaling limits, 
there is a natural candidate for what the scaling limit is, which is super Brownian motion. This actually is still open, kind of remarkably, considering how, how much we have known about high dimensional population for such a long time. Um, okay. So what about low dimensions? So once you go below the upper critical dimension, you really feel the finite dimensional nature of the model. Okay. And yeah. The super Brownian motion scaling limit is known for some other models. Say uh, it did uh, some uh, tree or uh, random. Hardly anything, actually, just branching random walk, basically. Uh, I, I have a project in progress to do it for the uniform spanning tree, but um, yeah. Um, okay. So, in low dimensions, you should really feel the effect of the lattice. And for D strictly smaller than six, this should really mean that the critical exponents are different. Okay. Um, on the other hand, it's very hard to understand what exactly happens. So, of course, the one case that we do understand well is two dimensions. Probably with this audience, I don't need to say much more about this, but two dimensions is very special, right? For a number of reasons, right? You have all these connections to conformal field theory, you have complex analysis, the Riemann mapping theorem, you have plane of duality, you have the topological features of plane curves having to cross each other. You, you know, there's, there's a large number of reasons that make two dimensions extremely special, okay? What about other dimensions though? Well, in this case, we don't really know very much about what, what to believe, okay? So the one, the, the marginal case is when you're actually at the upper critical dimension, an interesting thing here is that there are actually conjectures from the physics literature about what should happen, which remain, I, I would say, completely untouched by, by the probability theory or the, the rigorous community. So um, there's a paper by Esson, Gaunt, and uh, Gutman from the 70s where they have a heuristic derivation. So what you expect to happen is that at the critical dimension, you're almost mean field, but you're off by logarithmic factors rather than polynomial ones, okay? So they conjecture that the two-point function should be Green's function times a log factor the power is 1 over 21. And here you should get a log n, which is a two set. So I want to make a few remarks about this. So um, one thing is that there have been other models where probabilists have been able to prove rigorous versions of conjectures of this form. Okay, so one notable example is the weekly self-avoiding work, where there's a, you know there's this series of works by Bauschmidt, Bridges, and Slade, and others from five years ago or so, where they were actually able to prove a lot of things like this. Okay, now in dimension four. In dimension four, which is the critical dimension for that for that model. Yeah. Now the yeah, of course. So what are the obstacles to doing something like that for population? Well, there's actually there's a number of them. So one is that um, uh, first of all, the, this the way these uh, arguments work in the physics literature, they don't really study population. Right, so what they want to do is they want to do some kind of renormalization group analysis. And for their, for, for, to do that, you would really like to have more like a, a classical statistical mechanics field theory type model where you have a Hamiltonian and just put yourself in this more familiar setting of statistical mechanics, okay? And so what they do is they don't really argue about population. In this paper, what they do is they study what's called the phi three model, which is you take a Gaussian free field and you weight it by some e to the minus uh, cubics on the, uh, on the uh, just about the single side spins, okay? But the thing is, there's no rigorous connection between that model and 
and percolation. It's just kind of vaguely believed to belong to the same universality class. Okay, now that's a very different situation than for this model, because for weakly self-avoiding work, there's an exact isomorphism theorem between this combinatorial model of self-avoiding work and the sort of supersymmetric version of the phi four model. Okay, so that's kind of the first thing they have to do to even kind of put themselves in the framework where they can do things is to is to transfer into this other setting of kind of field theories. Okay, so that, that's one problem. But for percolation, we just don't know how to do that rigorously. I should say many of the other physics papers on percolation, they get around this issue in a different way. So instead they look at the POTS model with Q at least two. They work with general Q and you know derive expressions for the log correction or whatever. And then right at the end, they set Q equals zero. Okay, so one. Q. Uh, Q is one, sorry. Zero is the Spanish. Yeah. <laughs> set Q equals one right at the end. Okay, and of course this does presumably give you the correct answer, but it's very far away from a rigorous analysis. And they get the same exponents. They get the same exponents. Yeah, these are consistent with lots of other calculations that have been done in various papers, so that they're, they're probably correct. Okay. Now, so that, that's one issue. Um, another issue that is that the nature of this is that these arguments are all, they're kind of perturbative in, in a similar way to the lace expansion was. So, you know, they, they studied this model of weakly self-voiding walk, which is kind of like you take a path, it's actually a little bit different than this, they have a continuous time version, but it's like you take a path and you wait by the number of self-intersections of the path, right? You, you do something like e to the minus beta, You know, some of the pairs, you know, penalizing how, how often the path intersects itself. And for their arguments to work, they have to take beta to be extremely small. And again, it's this thing where you need to kind of start with something close enough. You know, it's going to converge to something Gaussian, but you need, you need to start off with it being near Gaussian, even at the first scale. Okay. And so, for example, when people study the Easting model, they, they don't really study the Easting model. Usually they look at the Phi 4 model. Uh, which is kind of like the Easing model, but again, with this kind of weak version there, it's a weak version of the minus one plus one enforcement that the Easing model has. And they have to take this parameter to be very small to, to even get started with their argument. Okay. So, uh, yeah, so the, the, there's a number of obstacles, you know, you need to be able to work directly with a population rather than going through some field, or, or you could find a field representation of population. That seems kind of like the boring way of doing it for me. And you also need a way of working in, in, in less perturbatively than how it has been done historically. Okay. So one more thing I wanted to mention, although it's a bit less related to my the rest of my talk, is that the way physicists like to understand low dimensions, so or so let's say dimensions three, four, and five in this case, so not two, but below the upper critical dimension. Well, these dimensions are very hard. So what they'd like to do instead is they like to imagine that, well, we know how to understand high dimensions. So let's expand around the high dimensional case, right? So you, in, for percolation, this would mean you look in six minus epsilon dimensions and you try to understand exponents as a function of epsilon. Okay, now, you know, as a mathematician, your first complaint will be, well, what does this mean? Okay, this turns out to be the sort of least serious problem with, with the approach. I mean, um, so, so I'll, I'll say long range models, one motivation for them is precisely to have a rigorous way of making sense of this. Uh, you could do fractals or something like that, but that seems to be a really bad idea. It doesn't seem to work. So I, I, I don't Can suggest you do a sort of slabs or something like. Uh, I, I don't think it's. An, I don't think that will work. I, I don't think you'll get the right thing. You you probably when you do that you'll you'll have like either be control controlled by one of the two dimensions that you have. You probably won't really see any genuinely intermediate. That that would be my guess. But. Even in the limit is the slab height goes to infinity. Yeah, I. Power or something. Uh, yeah, it's. I, I don't think you'll ever see something that really looks like five and a half. You'll you'll see 
you know, you'll look like five dimensions for all, six dimensions for a while, and then you'll look like five dimensions after that, but you, you won't really see this intermediate dimensional behavior. Okay. Um, good. So, and what they do is they try to expand things out. So this is the one point in the top where I always have to refer to my notes. So if you want to look at the physics of Charles, first of all, the Wikipedia page on percolation critical exponents is excellent. Uh, the most recent paper on this is by uh, Gracie from 2017. But for example, if you look at delta, it's supposed to be two plus two seven epsilon plus 565 over 6,174 epsilon squared. And there's a similar, similar expansion for eight. Okay. Okay. Um, so a few comments on this. One is that you'll notice that the uh, the powers of the logs appear as the uh, coefficients on the epsilon in these expansions, and that and that is a general phenomenon. Um, the other is that, you know, these expansions, they're not to infinite order, you know, they can compute finitely many terms. They're also, it's expected that even if you could compute them to infinite order, they would be divergent series. So they're only asymptotic expansions. If you wanted to actually use this to reason about exact values in three dimensions, for example, you would need to get into all these issues of Borel resummation or, or something like that. And that, that seems very much beyond you, the scope of, of uh, anything that can be done at the moment. Um, yeah. And there has been a small amount of rigorous work on this kind of thing, not for percolation, but for some other models. Uh, for example, and mostly in the setting of long range models, which I'll come to in a second. So, for example, Gordon Slade has some work uh, doing this to first order for the uh, Spin Owen model. Um, it's also okay. done by Dimmock and Hurd. Uh, bridges uh -huh. okay. for that. Oh. Yeah, so I should say this stuff is a little bit outside of my usual uh, wheelhouse. Okay. So, so what I really want to tell you about today, so this is the whole conjectural picture. Um, and I should say just maybe quickly for scaling limits, what one typically expects is that at the critical dimension, you get the same scaling limit as in high dimensions. You just need to scale a bit differently. So you have some additional log factors that go into the scale, but they don't actually change what the limit is. So that, that would be what you would do. Okay. So let me now tell you about long range percolation. And one of the ideas here is going to be we'll have an additional parameter with, and varying this parameter will be quite similar to varying the dimension, but we can do it continuously. Okay, so we'll start with the lattice set D, but now we just think of these as just the points. There's no graph, there's no distinguished role for nearest neighbors. And each, any two vertices could be an edge, and there'll be an edge with probability one minus E to the minus beta times the distance. So the minus d minus alpha, where we think of alpha is fixed, positive, and beta is our parameter. So beta is like p. If we increase beta, we get more edges. Okay. Now, uh, one thing I should mention is all the results I'm going to tell you about are very robust. So the exact form of this is kind of immaterial. You can use whichever norm you want. It's not going to change any of the, any of the results. Okay. Okay, so we can define beta c like we defined pc is before we think of the dimension and alpha as being fixed to see when do we get infinite clusters. And it turns out it's finite if and only if either b is at least two. Here there's just a trivial comparison with the nearest neighbor model or d equals one and alpha is less than or equal. Okay. 
So I think this result, I think in the case alpha straight pedestrian one, it's essentially a theorem of Dyson from the 60s. And I think the alpha equals one was maybe done by Michael and someone else. Uh, I have been Ju Newman and Schulman. Oh yeah, Newman and Schulman, that's it, yeah. Okay, thank you. <laughs> okay, so um, again, you should kind of think about alpha, when you vary alpha, it's quite similar to varying the dimension. And you should think that decreasing alpha is like increasing the dimension. Okay, now the exact way this works is kind of subtle. And um, <coughs> let me tell you something which is wrong, but which one often sees. And it's a reasonably good, good heuristic. So, one sometimes sees this definition of the effective dimension as the maximum of D and 2D over alpha, okay? So one way to think of this is it's the spectral dimension of the associated random walk that has this uh, jump kernel, okay? So this is a reasonably good way of thinking about it, but it turns out it, it's certainly not the case that the exponents are, are determined by the effective dimension, even though one does sometimes see that claim. Uh, it's not true. So, um, but this does capture the idea that decreasing alpha is kind of analogous to increasing the dimension. Okay. Um, so, <coughs> you know, it might seem that this model is more complicated than the nearest neighbor model, but it's actually better understood than the nearest neighbor model in many regards. So, for example, there's a theorem of Nernberger from 2003 that if alpha is strictly less than D, then no infinite clusters. Okay, so at least for smaller values of alpha, and this will be generally be a theme that the smaller alpha is, the easier the model is to understand. Uh, then, then we have this thing, okay? And we'll see in a second that the, this theorem does apply to models which should be in the same universality class as nearest neighbor population in three, four, and five dimensions, okay? So it's not that the models are all kind of trivial. These, these really should include things that are as interesting as the nearest neighbor model, okay? On the other hand, this result, so, we would believe that when dim the dimension is at least two, this should always be true. We should always have a continuous phase transition. But on the other hand, uh, it's a theorem of Eisenman and Newman from the from the eighties that the uh, the opposite is true. So when alpha equals d equals one, there's a discontinuous phase transition. So there's an infinite cluster at the critical point. Okay, so this theorem is optimal, at least in dimension one. <laughs> but in dimensions at least two, you don't expect that. Yeah, in dimension at least two, you should always have a continuous phase transition, but this is, uh, we're, this is the best result still. Now, um, so, when I first got interested in this, I actually didn't know about Noam's result. I came at it from quite a, from some other problems I was working on. And um, I, I, uh, my first result about this was to prove kind of quantitative versions of this theorem. Um, so Noam's theorem is completely, it's completely qualitative. It's a proof by contradiction. You assume you have infinite clusters at B to C and you drive a contradiction. It doesn't tell you anything about the model of criticality. So I had a first paper a few years ago where I proved that, in fact, under the same assumptions, you can prove some power law estimates on all the relevant quantities that you're interested in, which sort of non-sharp, non but, but explicit power law estimates. Okay. Um, so again, I, I, I got interested in this just because I kind of noticed that something else I was doing had the ability to prove this theorem. And in the course of writing the paper, I had to, you know, write the introduction and I had to figure out, you know, what, what are the actual correct exponents or what, what can we say about them? And I discovered a very interesting 
conjecture that I got kind of obsessed with. And basically, uh, this is not really specific to population. In fact, this was really developed in the context of the Ising model. But the, the general picture I'm about to say is supposed to be uh, occur all over the place. So the idea is to investigate how do the critical exponents depend on the parameter alpha. Okay. And let's say D is in two, three, four, and five, because this is kind of the most interesting thing. So first of all, let's look at this exponent eta. I'm going to write it as two minus eta because it makes the graph come out more, more nicely. Okay, so here's the first idea. If alpha is huge, so if you have this, it's still a power law, but a very fast decaying power law on the, on the edge kernel, it's plausible that the model behaves very similarly to the nearest neighbor model, right? So that probably they're in the same universal, universality class. If you take scaling limits, you'll probably get the same thing as if it was just nearest neighbor. OK, so what that means here is if alpha is big enough, this exponent should just fixate at whatever its nearest neighbor value is. OK, of course, this number is hard to understand. OK, now on the other hand, if alpha is very small, that's like the model being high dimensional. OK, so what we believe is that for high dimensional models, population should behave like branching random walks. OK, but it's not the usual random walk. It's the random walk that makes jumps proportional to this kernel, right? So when alpha is small, that's not converging to Brownian motion anymore, it's converging to a Levy process, okay? But we believe that um, for small alpha, the two-point function should be like the Green's function of the Levy process, which it turns out is this. Okay, so what that means is you just see this straight line here, okay? And the conjecture is that these are the only two parts of the graph. Okay, so if you want the whole dependence, you just join them up continuously. Okay. So this, of course, leads to this interesting special value of alpha, which is called the crossover value. Okay. Um, so the one thing this picture hides is that there's another interesting value of alpha, uh, which is not reflected in this picture at all which is d over three, which, which in this regime will, will be smaller than the crossover value. And d over three is where mean field behavior kicks in. So you actually don't see that transition from mean field from high dimensional to low dimensional in this particular picture. Okay, but you will see it if you look at a different exponent. So for example, if you look, look at delta, you'll see this graph that has three pieces where it will be fixate at two in the high dimensional regime, the small alpha regime, it will stick to its nearest neighbor value for large alpha. And then in between, it should follow this simple rational function of d plus alpha over d minus alpha. Okay, this is actually, this, this conjecture about delta follows it's sort of equivalent to this conjecture if you believe some standard scaling and hyperscaling relations. Um, so maybe I should just mention that the, the, the results I mentioned before, my, my first result on these models, just proving some power law bounds on it, it was some curve like, uh, like this. I think it was 2D plus alpha over D minus. This was the state of play as of like, three years ago. And do you know what the, what the prediction was for new? Uh, which one's new again? It's the correlation. Oh, like yeah, so that, that's in more, in, that's one of these things where you get into epsilon expansion territory. As far as I know, there's no conjecture. No, I think you got an exact, exact answer. Oh, you think so? Oh, I'd be very interested to hear about that because I haven't Indeed. seen any conjectures made. Okay, well, I'll talk to you about that afterwards then. Yeah. What value would be in, indicated by the triangle condition? Uh, the, this this is where the triangle condition holds. Delta equals two. Yeah, it's I certainly read 
physics papers where they were dealing with these other exponents using uh, yeah. expansions, but why have been helping? You know, you know, why didn't help? Uh, so I, there's some recent surveys of, uh, that I was reading that do uh, uh, from there's there's a group of Italians who did a lot of very detailed numerical simulations and they kind of survey the existing yeah. work in there as well. But anyway, anyway um, I'll, I'll talk to you about that. After. There, are other, there are other things that are related to this. Okay, great. Um, good. So, so how should you understand what's going on here? So, so here's how I'm thinking about it. So, well, the, let me tell you two different ways of thinking about it. So one way is if you take two big boxes, and you put them next to each other, you know, what is the most important way that this box interacts with this box? Okay. So, or, you know, if you take a big, a big cluster in the rectangle, how does it, how is it decomposed into big clusters in the boxes? Okay. So you can imagine one strategy to build a big cluster is you have a big cluster here and a big cluster here, and they both sort of touch the boundary a lot and they see each other through the boundary. So maybe boundary to boundary interactions are most significant. Right. Alternatively, you could have a big kind of diffuse cluster here, big diffuse cluster here, and they 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 mostly grow through like long edges, through bulk to bulk edges. Okay, and of course it's not that a priori the case that one of these two things has to be dominant, but it's plausible that usually one of these two things is dom dominant, and that's exactly giving you this separation into these two regimes. You have the boundary to boundary dominant regime, and you have the bulk to bulk dominant regime. Of course, at this critical point itself. You expect more complicated things to happen with because these two are kind of uh, you know, roughly equivalent. Okay. Um, now, a different way of thinking about it is that for large alpha, the model should behave like the nearest neighbor model on the Euclidean lattice. So, what should it behave like for small alpha? It should behave like the hierarchical model. Okay. So I'll explain what this means in a second. Essentially, the hierarchical model is going to be a simplified version of the model where you only have bulk-to-bulk -bulk interactions. So you, there is no possible effect of this boundary-to-boundary -boundary interest. Okay. So in fact, let me just define it now. So the idea is we're going to do exactly the same thing. We're just going to use a different metric, okay? So notice this definition of long-range percolation. We can do it on any countable <laughs> metric space. So the hierarchical metric will uh, decompose that the, let's say dyadically, Right, so you know you first split into side length two boxes, and then you split those into side length four boxes, and, and so on. Right. right. Let me let me use these angles for this this distance. And you set the difference to distance to be the side length of the smallest box. Smallest distinguished box in the in the partition containing both. Okay, so for typical points, this distance will be of the same order as the Euclidean distance. But of course, if you have you know a point here and a point here, they might be next to each other in the Euclidean space, but have a very large hierarchical distance. Okay, now it's not so apparent from this particular construction in terms of the Euclidean grid, but this um, space actually has a really large amount of symmetry much more than the Euclidean models does do. And um, this makes it much, much easier to study statistical mechanics models in the hierarchical sense, in particular to implement renormalization group type stuff. So, and indeed, there have been times in the past where, you know, many people in mathematical physics worked on computing critical behavior for hierarchical models. 
But for some reason, it has never really been popular in probability in the way that it has been in mathematical physics. I, I'm not, I don't have any reason for that might be true. Um, and, you know, it, it's often been a kind of precursor if you want to try to prove something about the uh, real Euclidean models using a renormalization group type approach, you should probably start by understanding the hierarchical case because it's easier. Okay. And, um, and it is expected that the exponents are the same or the logarithmic uh, are the same. Well, okay. They should be the same precisely in this region. Okay. Yeah. Now that means actually that you'll have if you if you tune things to be exactly at this parameter, then sort of everything is the same. Although you know that may seem like you're getting a lot, but you know the the value of this parameter is is complicated, so it's not really helping you. <laughs> okay. So the first um, thing I proved about this is that in the hierarchical model. Let me just write H. That's not my name, it's hierarchical. <laughs> uh, but it, it is also my theorem. <laughs> yeah. Okay, and this is that the two point function just always has this simple behavior, the same as the Green's function of the Levy plus. Okay. Uh, this is a, this is not such a hard theorem to prove, but there are some interesting new techniques going in there. Uh, and in particular, I, I, I would really like to stress that all these results are going to be completely non-perturbative, right? So in this sense, they're kind of avoiding certain ways of reasoning that are often used in this kind of literature to avoid having to have any of this dependence on, on what the parameters are. Um, so... Um, and, and this does follow as something like a renormalization-ish argument. In fact, really the way it works is using what I call a runaway observable argument. So you have some quantity you'd like to understand, and you show that if it ever gets 10 times larger than you think it should be on some scale, then it will start blowing up crazy, uh, crazily fast as you go up to higher scales. And that can't happen, therefore it must always be bounded by 10 times what you think it should be. Okay, so this is a very kind of coarse way of doing a renormalization-ish argument that avoids the kind of exact computations that one often wants to do. Okay, now this results about the hierarchical case. Okay, this is also my theorem, but it's Euclidean. Um, so what I was able to do is kind of push the proof of this to give a one-sided bound on the Euclidean model. So if you sum over x in the box, normalize by the volume, then this is bounded by a constant um, times and to the minus two. Okay. Um, so it's kind of annoying we don't get a pointwise bound, just an average bound, but I think the interesting thing here, so in other words, what this is saying is that, okay, that, that was a bad drawing, but that straight line is an upper bound on the value of, the, of, this, uh, of this experiment. Um, so the interesting thing about this proof, it really works by forcing a hierarchical structure onto the Euclidean lattice and basically using the hierarchical tools. Like you write the uh, uh, kernel for your population model as the sum of a hierarchical kernel and something else. Trouble is that something else is horrible. It doesn't have any translation variance or anything, <laughs> but you try to avoid looking at it as much as you possibly can and try to actually just push the, under the proof from the hierarchical case to the Euclidean. Now, uh, so, so this implies in particular that 2 minus eta is at most. Uh, okay. And um, something like two months after I put this paper online, 
uh, Johannes Bormler and Noam Berger, uh, both in uh, Munich, prove that 2 minus eta is at least the minimum of alpha and 1. Okay, so in other words, they, in particular, they proved a complementary bound in the case alpha is less than or equal to 1. Okay. Okay. Now, and you can also think of this a bit like pushing the hierarchical proof to the Euclidean one, but it, but it only works properly when alpha is small enough. This might not look very impressive the way I've drawn it. This is maybe the picture in four dimensions or something. But actually, in one dimension, this is the entire range of values of alpha that are interesting because you don't get a phase transition anymore when alpha is bigger than one. So for the one dimensional model, we actually have an exact computation of this exponent for all relevant values of alpha. Um, I should say their lower bound is also of this same form as on the average uh, on a box. And for two dimensions, well, one is bigger than two thirds. So this range that we can exactly compute the exponent for is not contained in the mean field range. You, you get a range of values between two thirds and one where the model is not mean field, but we can exactly compute the exponent. <laughs> Now, so again, I think one of the most interesting things here is, especially to, to experts, is that everything is again, completely non perturbative. Um, so, and the, uh, the unsatisfactory thing about these theorems is that they don't deal with this transition between the low dimensional and high dimensional cases. It's just, this is just invisible to them. Okay, and it makes sense because it's invisible <laughs> behavior of the two point function. Okay, so you know if you want to push further, you have to use techniques that are going to distinguish between the the low dimensional and high dimensional regimes. Um, so so far, I guess I can mention that uh, this. Kind of combining the sharp control of the two point function with the argument I had earlier lets you prove some better bound on, on this thing, which is now just 2d over d minus alpha. But we still don't know how to get the sharp upper bound on the uh, on the volume term. Okay. Although Noman Johannes can prove like this kind of you know the same thing the sharp lower bound when alpha is less than one. <coughs> So, so the newer results, and so far I've only been able to get anything to work in the hierarchical model. Um, the, the arguments are much more involved than the two-point function arguments, so it may be possible to push them to the Euclidean model. It's not really clear yet, um, but again, this is hierarchical is that if you look at the tail of the volume of the cluster at the origin, we can estimate up to constants in, in all regimes in the hierarchical model. So of course, in the high dimensional case, we get this one over root n. Okay, in fact, this already follows from the two point function result plus the triangle condition. Um, this is not so interesting. In low dimensions, we get exactly what we should, this same rational function that appeared before the exponents d minus alpha over d plus alpha. Okay, and finally, at the critical dimension itself, we can compute exactly what the log correction is. In this case, it's log n to the one quarter. Okay, so what time am I going to? Okay, cool. Um, good. So, um, so roughly the way this works is doing some version of the renormalization group type analysis. Of course, being on the hierarchical lattice makes that much easier. On the other hand, we do have these other issues that we that 
you know, I stressed before that we wanted to deal with. The first is kind of directly analyzing population rather than going through any kind of equivalent spin system, which we don't know to exist for population. And the other is to try to do everything in a non-perturbative way. Um, so, so these are both, th these, these issues are both overcome in this. Um, so, um, yeah, let's, before I say anything about the proof, uh, seeing as I don't have so much time, I'm not sure what, what interesting things I'd be able to say anyway. Let, let me say a bit about, you know, this results about the, um, about the volume tail. You know, this is kind of the output of the argument and, and it's a nice statement, but really the proof tells you a lot more than this and a lot more detailed information than this. Um, and it also tells you how, well, in sort of several ways, how to think about what is really driving the distinction between the high dimensional and the low dimensional case. Okay. So maybe. Um, Tommy, yeah. This, uh, this understanding, there is also the alpha C in the diagram. Yeah, but that's not present for the hierarchical model. Okay. Yeah, that, in, in, in the ZD, alpha C is exactly where you're transitioning from behaving like hierarchical to like nearest neighbor. For the hierarchical, you always behave like hierarchical. Okay. Right. <laughs> Yeah, but it, it should be, uh, I would expect to get exactly the same results in one dimension. I would also expect that, you know, when you're below six dimensions, then D over three is smaller than alpha C. So you should get the same log corrections and, and all that at D over three. But I, I, I'm certainly not proving that. So, um, so basically, the, the idea of the uh, the proof is well. First of all, the, there's a nice way of thinking about the model in terms of an infinite recursive sequence of multiplicative coalescence. So, if you haven't heard of the multiplicative coalescence before, it's kind of a fancy way of talking about Erdős-Rényi random graphs. So, multiplicative coalescence. It's a partition valued uh, Markov chain. Okay. And uh, where if you have two sets A and B, they merge at rates the product of their sizes. This is why it's called the multiplicative coalescent. Okay. So if you start the multiplicative coalescent just on the partition into singletons and you run to time t, the partition you get has the same law as the clusters of the Erdős Rényi graph, where p is 1 minus e to the minus t. Okay. And basically, the idea is for the hierarchical lattice, we have all these uh, blocks, which are the distinguished boxes of the dyadic partition. And what we're going to do is define a family of a sort of recursive family of these multiplicative coalescents, where, well, if the block is a singleton, this doesn't do anything interesting, so don't need to worry about it. Um, if it's not a singleton, we take the initial condition to be the disjoint union of the final conditions of its children. And we run for time Tn, which is B to C times two to the minus Okay, so each each block is running this multiplicative coalescent for a time which is decaying exponentially with the size of the of the block. Okay, but if it, it takes the final conditions of the previous things in it, as its uh, initial condition. Okay, so if you think about it for a minute, you'll see that this is really the same thing as hierarchical percolation. It's just a different notational framework for talking about. It. Okay, um, so in particular. If you look at x lambda tn, this is just the partition into clusters on scale. Okay, there's a slight subtlety in which edges you're using, which I won't explain. If, if you're confused, there is there is something going on here where, where I'm cheating you a bit. But basically, you should think of 
x lambda tn, where n is the uh, two to the, the box has side length uh, two to the n. Um, yeah, so x lambda tn is like the partition into clusters on scalar. Okay, um, and the nice thing about this is you can uh, think about the quantities you're interested in in terms of a kind of like in, in a more dynamical system sort of a pro, uh, framework, which is nice for doing renormalization type stuff in. And the idea basically is this parameter T is letting us like continuously add in the edges on scale N. Okay, and what we want to do is we want to understand what's happening there by differentiating stuff, basically. So let's let's write x n t, x lambda n t, where lambda n is the block on scale n containing the origin. Okay, so you can write down a bunch of differential equations governing sums of powers of cluster sizes. Okay, so for example. This means the sum of squares of all the cluster sizes. You can get a differential equation for this. It looks like, now I won't write the subscripts just to save myself time. The expectation is the sum of squares squared minus the sum of fourth powers. Okay. And you can imagine you can, you can write down similar formulae for the derivatives or kinds of things. And you know, if you if you wrote down the derivative of not only all the different sums of powers, but all the products of sums of powers, this would actually be a system of ODEs, which you know uh, is complete in the sense that every quantity that appears, you also have a formula for the derivative of. Okay. On the other hand, this system of ODEs you get is really complicated, and it seems very hard to understand. Okay, so here's the idea. Basically, what's going to happen? is that in high dimensions, this system simplifies approximately. So for example, what happens is that in high dimensions, this term is negligible, and this expectation of the square is approximately the same as the square of the expectation, okay? And so, and this is something you can prove just using the two-point function result that I did in the previous paper. Okay. <coughs> and now what happens is when, when th this is actually true even at the critical dimension, although it's much harder to see that it's true at the critical dimension, when you're really above the critical dimension, not only do these ODEs approximately simplify, but the error is extremely small. So you don't really need to worry about it. You can really do all your computations, they will come out the same as if you didn't have any error at all, up to some constants that come out that, that aren't interesting. Okay, so in particular, you're able to understand what's going on in the high dimensional case very precisely by just taking the results from the previous paper, which let you bound the errors, and then and then just computing with these ODEs. Okay, and on the other hand, in low dimensions, they don't simplify, right? In fact, what will happen is that all the terms will be of the same order. The error between the expectation of the square and the square of the expectations will also be of the same order. You know, it seems like it's totally hopeless, okay? But in fact, there's, there's a very fun thing that you can do. What you do is you, you, you do a proof by contradiction. So you want to prove that certain things have a certain order. Okay, and really the key thing is that there's quantity, which is the max cluster size in the box on scale n. Let's call this MN. Okay, and one thing I proved in my previous paper is that MN is always big O of two to the d plus alpha over two. Okay, you go smaller. And then small. Smaller, yeah. Sorry, yes. I wrote the right thing. Um, so, and it turns out that this, this inequality is always true, but it being sharp exactly characterizes the low dimensional regime. Okay. And the way you do it is you say, well, first of all, you have to argue that if this is actually little o of this, 
This is precisely the condition that you need to simplify all your IDEs. Okay. Now you do have to be careful again because in the critical dimension, it's only going to be little o by a lot, a, well, a polynomial factor. So things get a bit delicate. But still, it's exactly the condition that you need. And then what you want to do, the key thing that you get, like a handle on one interesting exponent in low dimensions, is you want to prove this is sharp. <laughs> so what you do is you say, well, if it's not sharp then I can simplify my IDs, I can do all my high dimensional calculations, and they tell me something which is false. Okay, of course, you have to be a bit careful because there's a <laughs> difference between it being little o and, you know, not little o versus big theta, right? I mean, it could oscillate or something, you have to rule that out as well. But that's basically the idea. And once you show that in low dimensions, you really have the clusters are really of this order, then you can start proving lots of other things about low dimensions as well. On the other hand, it's much less precise than the analysis in high dimensions. It doesn't let you compute like exact asymptotic constants and all that kind of thing that you can do when you're really working with the nicely simplified system of ideas. Okay, so in the end, there's a kind of a nice picture that emerges, which is that, first of all, what happens in low dimensions, if you look on a given scale, what you should imagine is that there are order one interesting clusters. In other words, if you, if you look at the first few largest clusters, those carry most of the interesting data that, that you want to use the, to understand other aspects of the model. Okay, and these have size two to the deep side. Okay. Whereas in high dimensions, it's not, this is really not true anymore. That it's these first few largest clusters that are interesting. It's more that you have order two to the D minus three alpha N interesting clusters. Maybe I should say important. So you have this many important clusters and they'll have size of order I think it's two to the alpha, two to the two alpha. Okay, so this is really what's driving this distinction is that, and, and this is related to why the so-called hyperscaling relations are only true in low dimensions, because they exactly say, you know, if two points are connected to each other, then they're probably just in one of these big clusters, and therefore you can say lots of exponents, like satisfy some additional relations, whereas it's not going to be true in high dimensions. Okay. But this is also precisely what's going on that lets you simplify these ODEs. Like, for example, the fact that the sum of the expectat the sum of squares is concentrated is exactly coming from the fact that it's contributed by like a large number of things rather than just order one thing. Okay. And then at the critical dimension, uh, it's sort of in between, but it's more like high dimensions in that you do still have a large number. It's just you have order n important clusters, and they have size smaller than this by a one over root n factor. Okay, and again, you should think of these really as log corrections because you're working on an exponential scale. Okay, um, so of course, if you actually looked at the biggest cluster, it should be larger than this by a logarithmic factor just because of the fluctuations, but the biggest cluster is not. Interesting. It's not really what you want to look at to other, understand other aspects of the model. Um, good. Uh, so that's basically all I wanted to say. Maybe I can mention some very recent progress from uh, just from last week. Uh, so I was talking, I was at a conference that I just traveled here from, and I was talking to uh, uh, Nicolas Brutin, and we believe that in the high dimensional case, including at the critical dimension, we can prove various scaling limit results um, when you work with periodic boundary conditions. Uh, we believe we can show convergence to the same scaling limit as the odish Renning random graph, including at the critical dimension. Again, the usual story there is that the critical dimension, you get the same scaling limit, but you have to have some log factors to, to, make, it, uh, to make it work. Uh, on the other hand, Scaling limits in low dimensions, I think, is an extremely interesting problem. It seems unlikely that they're related to any of the 
famous scaling limits and probability that we already know about. Uh, my paper gives various kind of tightness theorems for, for, for the limits, but you know, identifying them seems very hard. On the other hand, it is a hierarchical model, so it should be much easier than anything else. So maybe it's a good place to start looking. Uh, so I'll finish there and thank you again for listening. Any questions? Well, I, I, have you thought about the same thing in, uh, or I think type models or that kind of thing? Yeah, a little bit. I, I've been, uh, I have a student who I'm, uh, who's just started recently, but I'm going to hopefully look at these things with, because I think a lot of these things, um, yeah, it's funny that I think often people have this idea that everyone figured out hierarchical models 30 years ago and they're not interesting anymore. But I think that's actually not the case at all. I don't think any results like this exist for Ising, uh, especially non-perturbative ones. Um, does it make sense to um, do, do something different to different scales? Uh, so I, I don't know if uh, period, periodically, I don't know, uh, four scales which uh, alternate uh, and then repeat periodically. So maybe, uh, I, I don't know. Like switching between different it's exponents. Small alpha, large alpha, small alpha, large yeah, alpha. Uh, I, I don't know, or maybe. I think if you did it periodically, you should probably be able to analyze it in the same. I haven't thought about it, but I, I should say the, these newer results, this one, I use really one specific choice of kernel just because the computations are much more involved, but I think it should be universal. Um, for the old results, like about the two point function, uh, they tell you in particular, if you just have a one-sided bound, you know, like if your, if your kernel is just, the, so if, if this is, you know, the thing where the edge is present with one minus e to minus b to this, if this just satisfies some, some lower bound uh, like this, this is all you need to get the upper bounds. And, and conversely, if it has an upper bound, you get the lower bounds on the exponents. And I think if, if you start, messing around with these things. Okay. Certainly if you do it periodically, there, there shouldn't be any problem. I think the proof will go through exactly. If you start having like long stretches with one exponent and a long stretch with the other, I'm sure you can get some weird things to happen if you, if you really want. Yeah. Any other uh, questions? Okay. If there's no question, let's not